袁唐凤老师为我们演讲，掌声欢迎。Um, hello, everyone. I'm very happy to be here to uh, share with you for the next uh, couple of hours um, some thoughts around well, pretty much anything. Um, so, if you do have a uh, mobile phone or anything that can scan a QR code, uh, please use this QR code to get into the Slido system. <clears throat> or if you don't have a camera, uh, you can also manually type in Slido.com. That's S-L-I-D-O.com. And once you're uh, on the website. Enter the code 01206 without a pound sign, uh, and then uh, you get into this anonymous, well, not really anonymous, right? If you want to um, obtain the certificate for asking a question, you probably have to use your real name. But in any case, this is a way for people to ask me questions and also like each other's questions. If you have a question that you see that somebody else asked that you would also like me to talk about, uh, please just press like, and the question with the most number of likes will uh, float to the top. Uh, and time structure-wise, uh, we will um, talk for about one hour from now uh, until 7.50 or so, um, after which we'll take a 10 minutes break, uh, and then after that, another hour or so of conversation. Um, and so while you're probably uh, thinking of what question to ask, uh, here is a three minutes video that briefly explains uh, the work that I've been doing as the digital minister uh, in the past couple of years. Uh, and it's in Mandarin, but there is English subtitle. So it's still somewhat related to um, this class. Uh, and so I'll just play this video uh, for three minutes and then I'll just go back to Slido and let your Slido questions guide the conversation. So let's um, start. Mm-hmm. 而且民眾會覺得可以看到政府的努力,但我覺得這個是跟民眾不是是有一個正常關係的關係。People coming from one country to explain their process to the whole world. Yeah, um, this is Peter's is a bunch of extremely optimistic people.台灣的社會創新與民主主張,這一點在於行政部門以及公民社會中間的互信與協力。剛剛是是那個是有沒有是那想要用非你組織的模式來設立的公司公司這部分都來開會來溝通這些的話公司然後是一個很好的很好的機會對以前來講的話已經有保障去前進的一個大部分對今天你要做新創做設計這些的人
let's see what people have to um, ask. And please keep asking questions because otherwise um, I will just be talking about one specific topic for two hours. Be very boring. Um, but let's start anyway. Um, so, um, Xiao Yu Chen would like to know that the social communication software, such as LINE, uh, exacerbate the spreading of so-called fake news and how to prevent it. Um, and um, personally, I, I don't use the term fake news. I use the term disinformation. And the reason is that both of my parents uh, are journalists, uh, and I think the term fake news has two very different um, connotations. Uh, one is um, the output of journalists um, that are misunderstood, uh, that are misinformation. Or there are people who are not journalists um, creating works that imitate journalistic output. And these two, uh, like pretending to be news on one side and the news that is not fact on the other side, actually have very little overlap. Yet the term fake news describes both sides. Uh, and when I had a meeting with Dr. Cohen Zhe of uh, Taipei City, he thinks these two kinds are not fake news. He think um, that the output of journalists is accurate, but the editor uh, put a very misleading title on it, uh, what we call Belti Sharan in Mandarin, and he thinks that's fake news. And, and so, uh, I mean, everybody has a different definition of fake news, which makes it impossible to talk about. So um, at the moment, uh, we use the term disinformation in the administration, in the executive UN. Uh, and if you um, look for um, the three um, connotations, um, the falsehood, um, the intentionality, and the harm. And these are the three um, components of um, so-called disinformation um, in our administration. And that is a uh, actually pretty accurate news uh, by Zhang Li Guo of China Times um, that describes the Ministry of Interior's uh, latest re revisement of the uh, Social Order Protection Act um, that uh, includes, for the first time, the three um, components of disinformation, that is to say the intentionality, uh, the falsehood, and also the social harm. Uh, and so if it's only two of the three, for example, it's unintentional, uh, then it's not disinformation. Or if it's intentionally inaccurate, but it is parody, it is what we call kuso here, uh, which is not uh, actually causing social harm, then it's not disinformation. And, and so on and so forth. And so, yeah, that's our um, disinformation uh, definition. Now, the question uh, asked specifically about the line um, system. The line system is mostly end-to-end uh, -end encrypted, meaning uh, line, the co corporation, doesn't actually see the text that you send to um, your father. Uh, but this is not actually um, gender biased. Every time you visit Cofacts, it will change to a different family relationship. Um, so anyway, um, that is the um, idea. Okay, now this is less biased, but in any case, um, this is a effort done by a civil society project called Cofacts for collaborative fact-finding. Uh, and this is a uh, one of the primary ways that Taiwan currently has in terms of detecting disinformation on the line system. Because the line corporation doesn't have a copy of the message that you sent to um, another person. Uh, and so the corporation actually cannot see uh, the content of the message. On the other hand, if you have agreed to Line's term of use, Line actually knows about the sticker that you sent. But on the other hand, sticker is probably not disinformation, so it doesn't really help. Um, and so because Line doesn't see the textual message, we rely on the users, on the people who use the Line system to report this information. And so this is not a government-funded or a government-participated uh, uh, project, but we do uh, look at the database a lot. So if you um, have a line account and you add this bot 
uh, as your line friend, anytime you see a piece of message that you wonder is it true or not, you can forward to this bot, which uh, literally is named Zhen Den Jia, the is it true or not. Uh, and then it will collaborate uh, with the fact checkers uh, and to let everybody see the current trending database of the latest uh, virus, <laughs> the latest um, misinformation, which is unintentional, or disinformation, which is intentional uh, campaigns. Um, and we're, we're after the election now, so a lot of it is actually um, about health and things like that. Um, but again, there's also uh, political ones. Right, and so um, these are crowd um, sourced, meaning that everybody can join this uh, team and have any conversation uh, about a piece of disinformation that is being spread on the Alliance system. And it enables us to also see what is trending, actually, and that is uh, true. Uh, and so it is not all of this information. Some of it is just very popular, but it's actually um, correct like this one. Okay. And so it also lets us, uh, oh, it's actually, sorry, I misclicked. Um, right. So this is actually true. Um, the national insurance, uh, it has actually raised its interest rate, but it lets us see that it is getting very popular. And um, we can also learn from the fact that it's getting popular of how to package our information, our um, true information, and make them uh, more viral, that is to say more appealing. And so um, now you may wonder um, how many people are actually using the Copact system. Uh, at the moment, it's about 50,000 people uh, or 60,000 or something like that, uh, So, which is a small fraction of people. But the importance of having this system is not about having everybody using it. It's just like uh, back in the year 2000, uh, we had a problem with the email system. The email system at the time is full of what we call spam or junk email. Uh, a lot of people were saying that they're a uh, princess from Nigeria, have a lot of money, uh, want a uh, bank account and things like that. And uh, at that time, people's uh, email inbox was filled with all these junk emails. And because sending email costs nothing, uh, people can very easily spread uh, junk mail around. Uh, so at the time, our solution to the junk mail problem is exactly the same as Cofax. We ask people to flag uh, email as spam. That is to say, to report to a public system what email, incoming email is junk mail. As soon as a small fraction of internet users, email users, starting to contribute by flagging as spam, there is a public uh, clearinghouse, a public organization called Spam House um, that looks at the um, signature of those spam emails and then it sends advisory to all the email providers like Gmail or Hotmail and so on saying, okay, many people reported an email like this as spam, so maybe by the next time you receive this message, you can also mark it as spam, or if you're using Gmail to move it to the junk mail folder, you have to click junk mail to actually see it. And so um, the importance of a reporting mechanism is very important because the line, just like like email is mostly an individual communication system. And so uh, we cannot use Google search or any public message uh, systems to view what's currently trending. We can only rely on people individually to report it as soon as they find it. But now that we have a database, um, it's no longer in the dark. You can see that many people, nine people have reported a particular um, uh, message, which is incidentally true, but you can see what is um, currently trending at the moment, right? Uh, and so it brings uh, the messages from the dark, um, encrypted, um, unmonitored uh, line system into the public Google searchable web where everybody can talk about one specific message and uh, collectively to do uh, fact checking. And so that connects to another endeavor, uh, another effort 
done by, again, an independent uh, civil society organization called the Taiwan Fact Check Center, or the TFC. The TFC uh, is the next um, move after the COFACTS. COFACT is like reporting junk mail, and Taiwan Fact Checking Center is like spun house. It actually looks at those trending rumors. Uh, for example, um, previously there was a uh, widely spreading rumor about the referendum that we just had, uh, had a binding power that is higher than the Constitution. Now, for people who have studied law or public administration, um, this is obviously not true, uh, but many people actually believed it, or at least believed it enough to spread it, and so it gets really viral on, on uh, social media um, for a while. Uh, and so the Thailand Fact Checking Center actually looks at how viral each message is getting and use investigative journalism methodologies. They interviewed uh, third party independent experts, the administrations and stakeholders related to these uh, issues, uh, and then uh, publish a conclusion. And so the methodology that they do this kind of fact checking is by itself transparent. And they're again not partisan and they um, actually um, are completely composed of people who are professional journalists or uh, academics uh, working in journalism. And so that is the second step, is to take those trending rumors and run it through an investigative reporting mechanism and publish a clear like this is the fact check report 40 uh, and uh, um, the claim and the review of the claim as false. And so that is the next uh, step, the second step. Now the third step, which will occur, I think, uh, late January next year, that is to say a couple months from now, is that because the Taiwan Fact Checking Center is part of an international network called IFCN, the International Fact Checking Network. Uh, it is a uh, network, worldwide network, uh, started by the Pointer Institute. Any member of the IFCN, including the TFC, uh, has the power to change the algorithm, that is to say the code, of, say, Facebook or other uh, popular search engines. But let's take Facebook as an example. Facebook has agreed publicly that early next year they will mark any um, disinformation that is marked as false by the Taiwan Fact Checking Center uh, to um, reduce its popularity. So it will not reach that many people. Um, they said that on average it will reach only less than 20% of the initial audience that it has, meaning that the sharing this piece of uh, this information will have less of an effect than it previously had, simply because Taiwan Fact Checking Center have fact checked it as false. And for the few people who still see this piece of message anyway, they will put a clear um, indication on it, saying that it is disputed content and then link back to the Taiwan Fact Checking Center so that people can understand that this piece of information is being fact checked and it is disputed and is an alternate account on it and if people still share it, they need to understand the consequence of sharing uh, this information like this. And so that is the third step. So we bring it from the line into the Taiwan Fact Checking Center and now back into the social media where they can clearly mark it as disputed content and also reduce its virality exactly like how Gmail uh, will sort junk mail as junk mail or mark it as spam. And so that is the three uh, components of the fact checking process uh, that we've been um, encouraging the civil society and the private sectors to work together in the past couple of years and we're now very close uh, to have this whole pipeline work uh, in a concerted fashion. So I hope that answers at least part of the question. And feel free to ask follow-up questions. Uh, but I will not stay on this page for very long because it is kind of polluting the mind. And so everybody's mental health, um, I will just go back to the other questions. All right, there's quite a few more questions. That's great. There's nine questions. Um, uh, Ling Minghui would like to uh, say good evening to everyone, and also it's just a test. Uh, I don't even know whether this counts uh, into the certificate uh, question or not. Uh, but anyway, uh, good evening. Uh, 
Um, an anonymous person uh, asks, uh, how do I view the outcomes of the referendums? Um, it's, it's very interesting because uh, we see through a lot of COFACT or Taiwan Fact Checking Center that there's many people who went to the referendum, they put a yes or no on the referendum, and they thought that it has a certain effect, but the referendum act actually doesn't give the referendum this much effect. For example, it doesn't supersede the constitution, uh, but people are of course, free to um, imagine however they want, but I think it also outlines a fact, which is that we're not used to referendums. Taiwan actually have very little experience when it comes to uh, social and not political referendums, and it really shows, right? Because in like Switzerland, um, there is a continuous conversation about referendums. They hold many referendums every year, and people are just getting used to the idea that there is a long dialogue of what exactly does this referendum do if it's passed uh, way before it's actually put to vote. But in Taiwan, although the Central uh, Election Committee does do a kind of television debate, uh, but the quality of the debate, uh, there is no quality uh, mechanism, right? They just ensure the fairness in the time, right? So each of uh, the pro and con side uh, have the equal number of minutes, but that's all um, the CEC does. Uh, there is no extra time or extra uh, conversational deliberation. Of course, the public TV, uh, as well as some journalists, tried to bring the both sides or many sides into a discussion, but the outreach of these efforts, I think, is less uh, than the total number of people who put yes or no on that particular referendum. And so that leads to post-referendum a lot of dispute of or um, disillusionment of what exactly does the referendum do, right? And so uh, I think that is a structural issue with the referendum and that we need to address it by ensuring that there is a high quality conversation well before people go to the referendum booth. Uh, and that's the one thing that we can help improve. The other thing is that, of course, um, I guess many of you worked as um, um, the election staff um, so um, if you stayed until well into the night, or like uh, in Taipei City, they stayed until the midnight uh, to, to finish the tallying work. Um, um, I'm very appreciative of your work, and I very, feel feels very sorry about um, that people have to spend this much time uh, to, to tally all the referendums. Again, this puts an enormous burden on people running the local election booths. <coughs> and so, it is um, still free of conflicts and violence and so on, which is a huge credit uh, to the people actually uh, running the elections. But I think uh, if we continue like this, uh, it will make it very difficult to retain people who are still willing to be election staff uh, because it is really too much work and for uh, no difference in payment <laughs> or uh, actually it is a very frustrating uh, kind of work. Uh, and so I also offered um, my service uh, to the Central Election Committee uh, if they want um, help in, for example, automating the vote counting, uh, then I'm happy to help as well. Of course, uh, the CEC being an independent commission, they're free to uh, choose whatever methodology they want, but I'm very willing to help um, the staff who counts the votes, uh, because in um, other countries, even though they're still using paper ballot, it is not one uh, ticket per referendum uh, issue. It is actually just a single ticket, and you can just choose yes, no, yes, no, yes, no on a single um, tallying paper. And once uh, you put it in, then it's easy actually, like the money counting machine. You can use uh, optical machines to very quickly count through a large number of these papers. And so if the voting ends on 4 p.m., the counting can be done by 4.30. Right, and, and so <laughs> saying everybody gets to go home, <laughs> uh, and instead of uh, just just telling until midnight, uh, and, and I think uh, even uh, the people going to election, of course, have a long line, uh, and that's something that we can 
solved by actually just allocating more room, but the tallying is actually, it will still go well into the midnight if we have more than 10 referendum issues. So my focus has always been to improve the uh, experience of people running the election booths, uh, because we know that solving the long line uh, is relatively easy, you just allocate more space, but the tallying itself is still very time consuming. Now, of course, um, people worry about the trustworthiness of the machine counting, um, but I think there's quite a few ways to solve this issue. Uh, one is that uh, we still use the traditional tallying for voting for um, legislators or presidents or, you know, for any voting um, people. We can still use the old method, which we know will end uh, approximately one hour or so uh, after the end of the voting. So we just use the counting machine for the referendums. And the second is that we can also randomly um, to uh, hand tally the same piece of uh, papers in selected uh, voting booths to prove that the machine is not biased. And also the machine itself um, can be uh, open source or mathematically verified. There's many solutions that are open and they don't connect to the internet. And indeed, they don't even um, need to be turned uh, powered on uh, during the election. They are strictly just for counting purposes. And so I think um, this is one of the interventions that I uh, said uh, well, publicly, but also internally, that I would uh, very much encourage the CEC to investigate. Uh, I think their report is due in a few weeks, and then we will see uh, how much we can adopt this technology in the next referendum. But they're an independent um, commission. I have to uh, stress this again. So if at the end they don't want to do things this way, there's really nothing I can do about it. But, but I really want to improve the telling experience. So um, someone asked, are there many social enterprises in Taiwan? This is a great question. Um, in most of my talks, um, I um, oh, this is my office, by the way, um, the uh, Social Innovation Lab uh, in Taipei. Contemporary Culture Lab, or the C-Lab, uh, previously known as the TAF, the Taiwan Air Force, um, near the Jianguo Flower Market. And so this place is actually designed together by uh, more than 100 social enterprises. Uh, and the soccer field that you see here are contributed by uh, people with Down syndrome, uh, Xihammer, um, of the Children RS Foundation. And the Children RS Foundation actually works with people with Down syndrome for, I think, more than 20 years now. Uh, and even the term Xihammer is a social innovation because previously people uh, called people with Down syndrome as, I don't know, Zhizhang or something, right? Uh, which is a, a very, um, um, like not very popular term and it also portrays people in a very negative fashion but just by rebranding it, um, these uh, friends as Xihammer, it actually creates an opportunity for people to engage with people with Down syndrome and see their special, unique contribution to the society. So, uh, for example, uh, these are the drawings of people with Down syndrome. It turns out they understand the world through a geometric perception, just as maybe we're good at um, text or we're good at numbers, we're good at um, you know interaction and things like that. Everybody has different modalities. It turns out people with Down syndrome have a special perception um, intuition in terms of geometry. And so their painting, when they see the space and they draw something, it's very unique and it leaves a lasting impression on people. And so um, people with Down syndrome contributes uh, to the design of the office, which has also won uh, the Good Design Award uh, in Japan. And so Xi'an, of course, is just one of the many social enterprises uh, that people know about. Um, there's also cooperatives, uh, one of the largest co-ops, the Homemakers Union, is also more than 20 years old now. Um, and initially, they started as a charity uh, to advocate for environmental protection. But very quickly, they found that by assembling together people's buying power, it's actually easier to negotiate with people working on agricultural products and other products to do so in a sustainable way. And so that buying 
buying power, the purchasing power, uh, becomes an important tool in their advocacy, and then they form a consumer co-op to this goal. And of course, there are also companies uh, with a social um, impact purpose. Uh, one um, example is Li Ren, which is also more than 20 years old, that focus on environmental sustainability. And there's also companies that are subsidiary of a MPO. Uh, for example, the Ziji uh, Foundation uh, owns 100% the uh, Dai Gan um, technical uh, technology company. I think they just call it Ta um, I, I think. That that's the name of the technology company, uh, which is an AI company, I guess. But in any case, uh, the Dai Gan company specialized in circular economy, uh, reusing the um, recycled, um, I think, all, all sorts of different things, but mostly plastics, and makes clothing and things like that uh, using those recycled material. And once people are done uh, wearing these clothes, they can also then recycle it again and make them into eye, uh, eyeglasses, and sunglasses, and things like that. So they, they call it uh, the second time uh, recycling. And they're also quite profitable. And so it, it shows that uh, um, the enterprise um, marketing, uh, business development, supply chain management, and so on, does not actually have to uh, work uh, in opposition to the environmental or the social or the governance solidarity uh, needs, but rather through social innovation, you can bring all these forces together as exemplified uh, by Dai Gan and Li Ren, uh, Xianer, and the Homemakers uh, Union. And so, at the moment, we maintain in se.p.tw, um, a list of social enterprises in Taiwan, and you can very easily choose among the kind of service uh, and purpose that they, they do. Um, you can focus on the particular um, city or county that they are in, and we can also um, very quickly um, look for um, the enterprises that had made public disclosures uh, in the previous year and things like that. So there's a, um, I think, pretty long list actually of social enterprises here. And some of them, as you can see, has chosen uh, to review its founding documents, its, its company charter. And the good thing about revealing the company charter is that we can understand that this company is actually formed for a specific purpose, the so-called cradle-to-cradle um, theory, uh, and there is uh, no matter how many shareholders join the company, they have to agree by the company's founding document that the uh, purpose of the company is for environmental sustainability and so on, instead of just for profit. And this is possible because uh, in our new company act, effective as of November the 1st, uh, we changed the first line of the Company Act. It used to say that uh, um, companies are only for profit, but now the first line now says that the uh, company not only it has to be ethical and, so, and be uh, compliance and regulation, but it can also may uh, adopt the behaviors that are uh, conductive to public benefit and also contribute to uh, social responsibility. And so that means that each company can now legally say, I want to devote 100% of my profit into my social mission and the shareholder never earns anything. That is the so-called Yunus style um, social business. Or they can say, uh, shareholders may get 50% of the uh, earned income, but the other 50% has to be put back uh, into the social and environmental purpose, that is the so-called benefit corporation, uh, and so on. So everybody get to declare exactly how they are balancing the profit motive uh, with the purpose motive, and that is a new uh, innovation actually uh, by our new company act. So now there's many um, companies now choosing to review its purpose in this way, and if you click uh, more information, you are actually brought into the Ministry of Economic Affairs uh, website, where it has a legal um, self-disclosure, 
right, of the company charter. And to post it on the MOEA website, you actually need to use your Gongshan uh, Deng your business certificate card, uh, in order to put anything here. And so it carries the um, legal weight of an electronic signature. So not only the shareholders can look at a founding uh, charter document, but also people on the supply chain would be investors, as well as any stakeholders related to this particular social enterprise. So it improves the so-called accountability of the companies because they're a closely held company uh, they're not publicly listed but this is essentially holding them to account on the same level as publicly listed companies in order to get uh, the trust from the stakeholders as well as the so-called impact investors and so that is um, the, the list that we have here. So feel free to just contribute to this list. And if you know a social enterprise, it can be a co-op, it can be a um, foundation, it can be an association, it can be a company. Um, please um, encourage them to uh, register themselves here because registering uh, here um, engages the uh, social procurement system that we have, um, the enterprises that include these social enterprises in the supply chain, um, if they reach, say, one million Taiwan dollars every year, uh, I, I actually come out and uh, give them an award for, for buying from social enterprise and including social enterprise in the supply chain. And they also qualify for uh, a lot of innovation, loan treatment, and, and other um, subsidies um, from the government. Uh, but uh, there's no tax breaks because we understand if we do tax break, then every company will want to be listed as a social enterprise. Uh, so we're not doing tax breaks, but we, we do offer a lot of resources, uh, which are all listed here. There is a government resources list, and depending on the purpose that they work, as well as the kind of service that they need uh, from the um, administration um, or the local government, we actually list all the relevant uh, government projects related to social entrepreneurship and they can then directly connect to the Council of Agriculture, the uh, Ministry of Culture, uh, and things like that, right? And so, yeah, all these are public information uh, for qualified social entrepreneurs. Uh, Liu Dai would like to know um, how can we help senior people uh, to turn their back on the false medicine information on online. Uh, I, I think uh, Liu probably means specifically on the line uh, system, but also online, as in on the internet. Um, there are uh, many ways that people can receive uh, misinformation, um, just mistaken information uh, on medical issues. Um, there's, um, as far as I know, there's many people working on this problem. Um, there's, there's MediPartner, I think, uh, or MedPartner. Um, right. That uh, focus on uh, spreading um, actual factual information in a uh, in a way that is appealing to senior people. Uh, and there's, of course, the COFACT system that uh, focus on the line uh, system specifically. Uh, and there's also many other uh, systems uh, in Taiwan. It is actually a very popular uh, startup um, topic <laughs> for people to work on. So there's many different systems. But I think it all uh, depends on the attitude that we introduce uh, to, to senior people. Uh, if they hear it from their friends uh, through telephone conversation or through face-to-face, -face, it takes at least the same uh, intimacy, like you have to actually talk to the senior people over dinner or face-to-face or, -face or on the phone in order to um, to fully understand the context that they receive the misinformation from. Now, if it is only a picture from the line system or whatever, then of course, Cofax as well as the other websites are sometimes already sufficient because they receive it just a uh, single uh, piece of information. And so you can just reply it with a single piece of information. And because uh, they trust you more, they are more amenable uh, to the information that you deliver. Uh, but if it's a, 
of physical uh, interaction and they heard it from another friend, then of course it takes a more investigative uh, way of dialogue. And so, yeah, I think there really is no sure way to um, uh, telling people, senior or junior, to turn their back on it because curiosity is a natural part of, of human beings. So I think our work is not actually to um, discredit um, the line system or any online system altogether, but rather to engage in what we call media literacy, which is to literally see any piece of message as incomplete instead of uh, the perfect answer. Now this is, of course, especially difficult for senior people because when they were educated either under the Japanese system or the uh, RLC system uh, back then, um, it, it's a lot of emphasis on standard answers. And so if people focus on standard answers, then people tend to see a piece of information as entirely true or entirely false. But it is very rarely uh, the case. Now, of course, people who work um, in schools no longer teach things this way ever since the education reform and for the new curriculums, but particularly uh, critical thinking, media literacy, the idea that the teacher doesn't know the perfect answer, everybody has to discover their world together. It is, of course, part of our education plan already, but for senior people who were, were not educated in this way, I think it's still important to use the same uh, co-learning attitude and methodologies in order to uh, regrow a faculty for critical thinking and media literacy. Um, the K-12 curriculum designed the media literacy as one of the nine core um, characters uh, and it requires 12 years uh, to finish the um, media literacy um, design in the, in the curriculum. So the senior people will also need like six years of basic education, three years of additional interaction and so on in order to uh, not turn their back, but actually to grow the capacity of critical thinking. So there's no um, shortcut to this process. It is just by through uh, continuous dialogue and continuous interaction. So like personally, I have a uh, long conversation by phone with my grandma, who, who is uh, 86 years old now, uh, about the trending issues and things like that every week. And so I get to learn a lot about the kind of misinformation uh, that, that her social circle uh, tend to spread. But I don't pretend that I have all the answers, rather we just collectively um, look at the evidences and discover the uh, pieces of the puzzle together. Um, Chen Jia Jun uh, would like to know uh, about the open data environment for uh, memory institutions uh, such as libraries, archives, and museums. This is a great uh, question. Uh, well, it's much better now because uh, back when open data was adopted as a national strategy in 2012 and put into implementation in 2013, uh, we had a um, concerted effort from all the different ministries, I think in late 2014, uh, to adopt a what we call an open license. Um, the license is the most important uh, foundation of open data because um, it allows people to use the data for any purpose. And so, um, in the open, national open data platform, uh, we say that all the different ministries need to adopt the uh, ideally the same license, but uh, actually the uh, principle of open open definition. And the open definition, very simply put, is that um, it allows anybody to use the data for commercial and non-commercial purposes. They can use it in a way that changes the data, that analyzes the data, that visualizes the data. It doesn't put any restriction on the kind of the work or um, replication that people can do. 
All it asks is to give due credit, that is to say, to attribute to the source of data, and it doesn't guarantee the um, accuracy of data and things like that. So this is the Open Government Data License, or OGDL, uh, of Taiwan, and at a time, almost all ministries are committed to uh, adopt this license. But there were two exceptions, that is to say, the Ministry of Culture and the National Palace Museum. Uh, and so um, the National Palace Museum is actually part of the cabinet and doesn't belong to the Ministry of Culture because we have a very interesting constitution. But in any case, uh, these two memory institutions at the time um, insisted on um, using a license that uh, prevents commercial use in some way or uh, asks for additional licensing cost in some way and, and things like that. And so uh, that creates a real um, asymmetry, a imbalance uh, of the government's message. It's like we do open data for everything except for the National Palace Museum and other museums. Uh, but I'm very happy to uh, report that uh, when I joined the cabinet in late 2016, uh, we worked with NPM and with the MOC very closely. And so by last year, both of these memory institutions have changed their licenses to a compatible one to the open government data license. And so um, if you now go to the uh, National Palace Museum, website, uh, then you can actually see all the different uh, pictures that they have uh, in their data store and offered through a uh, open data platform. And that is actually uh, in English also, and also offers a API for search. Uh, and also there's a lot of uh, download for all the different parts, um, as, well, as well as the image uh, of their um, 5,700 um, collection. And, and all of this, of course, as you can see, um, says that it's under the Open Government Data License. And so it is actually a very uh, large um, improvement compared to the uh, previous uh, administration's National Palace Museum. And also the Ministry of Culture worked with the Ministry of Science and Technology uh, on the uh, model library. I think. Um, I think that's the right thing to use. Yes, the Taiwan Digital Asset Library. Now, uh, it is less um, popular, I guess, than the National Palace Museum. The National Palace Museum is very well known, uh, but the Taiwan Digital Asset Library is uh, somewhat less well known. Uh, so I would like to, to introduce it to you uh, if you haven't seen this before. But they actually worked very hard uh, to scan all the important historical buildings that they can get access to, uh, and so on, uh, into like virtual reality compatible um, images. And so I think what's the important thing here is that the kind of license that they offer enables not only domestic uh, creators to include these um, cultural artifacts into their work, like comics or video games or movies or whatever, but it also encourages uh, international creators like filmmakers and so on to very easily incorporate it in their work also. And this is important because, uh, for example, the New York City has offered something like this, which is why a lot of video games and movies and whatever features, uh, you know, a outlook on New York City and things like that, because it's very easy to do animation based on these data. And now uh, through this uh, Taiwan Digital Asset Library, we now also make sure that the uh, people working on creating uh, new artworks and so on can also very easily place their work in a setting that is based on a cultural heritage site uh, in Taiwan. And so I think uh, this is also a, a pretty good contribution. Now, uh, of course, uh, a lot of the archives and memories and uh, uh, input to the museum is now also generated uh, by citizens. And so we have a Guojiaqi uh, Guo National History Project that then links uh, the part that is contributed by people locally. And then um, in this project, we of course work with all the municipal um, governments. Uh, and 
through linked data uh, to link these uh, contributions together uh, with the various contributions uh, in the local municipality. Um, on the other hand, uh, HTTPS is perhaps not yet done, uh, but in any case, yes. Um, yeah, so uh, if you look at the Taichung Municipal uh, Open Data Platform, you can see that it is not just about the data, uh, but it actually uh, offers what we call a linked data um, repository, meaning that you can, uh, using a very simple language, similar to the SQL language uh, in the database, you can actually look at all the different data sets that's part of the Taichung uh, data set and uh, make uh, summary queries, statistics, analysis, and so on. And so it's not just one single data set next to each data set, but also the link, the relationship between these data sets can be linked together in a public way and for people to uh, constitute their own view uh, to the statistical and the contributions of the data. And that, again, is very important because in Taiwan, um, when we say open data, we don't only mean open government data. We actually also mean open data from the citizen scientist. Um, for example, in Taichung, a lot of people uh, care about uh, air quality, uh, and uh, all these contributions are from citizen scientists um, that uh, work with the so-called air box uh, vendors, and each one is less than uh, 100 US dollars or so, and because of this, it's very easy for 2,000 or more people to put uh, such
你們留中文全名我們這邊才可以找到你們是誰然後把它當成那個發言記錄謝謝然後這是最後一次來到的發問所以可以大家可以把握機會只要你有發問就可以算在發言記錄裡面謝謝start. So um, the staff would like to remind people uh, if you had used an English name to post your question, that actually doesn't count. Um, so uh, you can ask the same question again uh, by using uh, Chinese characters uh, so that it can count uh, toward the tallying system. So um, Irene, uh, you know, 
which I would like to know, uh, do I have any suggestion to civil servants? So during the 10 minutes break, uh, there's a um, colleague uh, who went to ask a question about how to improve the digital experience of the IT system uh, that their um, agency is using. Because um, we all have this experience of a IT system that is maybe web-based, but it only works with IE or even only with IE9 or something like that. Uh, it doesn't work on mobile or if the vendor <coughs> Uh, decide to implement some new feature or the agency leader decides to implement a new system it turns out that the new system is only covering part of the work of the old system so now you have to work on two systems and things like that is all very commonplace uh, in public service um, and this is why we developed um, actually with a lot of contribution from Taichung but also from Taipei City and other municipalities um, the Government Digital Service Guidelines or the GDSG um, at the moment this is in beta meaning that we're still trying it out we use this um, guidelines to develop for example the text filing system for Mac and Linux users for this year which has a 96% approval rate uh, because we understand users needs which is the most important uh, part in this guideline there's uh, no other um, important parts uh, I think uh, all the other 12 guidelines is in the service of continuously understand what the user really needs uh, and I would like to share with you um, some notes that I took when we uh, worked with all the different contributions of the um, municipal governments and so on uh, and working on the GDSG, it's called GDSG now, right? Uh, and as I said, the most important thing is uh, understand what the user needs uh, and in procurement uh, for public construction projects, for example, building a bridge or things like that. Everybody in the procurement understand you need first to do feasibility study. You need to do the impact, social impact, environmental impact analysis. And then you work with the architect firm uh, to develop a uh, visual mock-up uh, or a simulation of the project and then you do a actual scaffolding or whatever design, the BI and mapping and then finally you put concrete uh, in and actually construct the building. So there's a well-defined uh, phase of uh, public construction project and all people understand that all these um, um, different phases require different disciplines, different um, professional services uh, in order to complete. Uh, but for um, digital um, procurement projects. It is very um, commonplace for people to just choose a system integration company and leave it to the SI company to do everything uh, and without actually uh, listening to user feedback. Now the SI, of course, they're also very professional that they may not be very well equipped in understanding the first line experience of users be exactly because they're too professional. Um, Back uh, last year, last May actually, um, we had a petition that says the uh, tax filing software is explosively difficult to use. Uh, and the reason why is that for people using Mac and using Linux uh, last May, uh, they use a old technology called Java applet uh, and it interferes with the operating system in such a way that it says uh, installing components please wait and then it's supposed to pop a window up, but it's actually blocked uh, by default on uh, Apple. Uh, and so, uh, like the MP Wang Guochang actually waited for, I think, four hours or something, uh, and, and could not actually complete the text filing uh, steps. There's many, many different steps uh, to complete the process. But when the Ministry of Finance working with the SI, um, they of course did their, their KPI, they did their uh, check marks during the procurement verification, but they're too professional. They, they know exactly what to feel, where, when, and so they were able to complete the text filing process uh, in 10 minutes or so, and they think it's pretty good. But actually, uh, the people who don't have this professional experience find it very, very difficult to uh, complete the steps in the text filing experience. The same can also be said of the referendum that we just had. The Central uh, Election Committee says that they did a simulation of the referendum, uh, just taking 10 um, ballot t 
tickets and filing 10 yes or no questions and putting them in. And they said, you know, it took us only two minutes on average uh, to complete the process of filing in the ballot and referendums. Uh, of course, because they're very professional <laughs> and they know exactly what the referendums are about. But most people actually don't know exactly how uh, how each referendum is to be tallied. And so a lot of people just spend a lot of time reading over the referendum text, right? Uh, and so um, the user testing by real, actual users is of utmost importance, not just about digital service, but about services in general. And so what we did essentially is a what we call a service design uh, exercise, uh, like product design. You can design a beautiful product, but it's um, less well known that you can also apply the same design uh, principle into design a good service. And so when applying service design principles, we just invited everybody who complained about the text filing system into our collaboration workshops. And it's very important in service design to map what's actually happening before a service starts, what people's actions are, what are their needs, what kind of issues they run into, and then during the service, uh, what kind of different mapping, this is called a journey, um, are the different stops that they stop at, what are the touch points, and what are the people on the internet's feedback about each and every step. So a lot of people say that the uh, words are explosively um, numerous, that is too baroque, uh, too flourishing, and people are actually very confused about uh, these kind of illustrations. And also last May, uh, if you have filed tax last year, at some point there, there's a mascot from the um, uh, tax agency that pops up and says, thank you for your contribution to the country, uh, supposedly to make you feel better about the tax filing uh, experience. But somebody from the internet said very acutely that they uh, feel very bad uh, thinking about tax already. So just make it short. If it's painful, make it short, right? It's called tong kuai for a reason, right? If it's painful, just make it short, make it quick, and don't spend any time on making us feel better. We don't feel good. So just shorten the time. That's all it takes, and so on. And so it's very important to take in all these accounts, um, but of course without the more emotional part or the uh, exclamation marks. But we do stick to whatever people input it and put it on a visual map that let us know exactly what went wrong during the user experience. And then we set up four collaboration workshops to work on particular aspects in each and every uh, step during the journey. And so the people who complain the most are then invited into the kitchen as chefs, so to speak. Um, and so um, we can then turn something like this into something like this. Uh, and the important thing is not just the uh, simplicity or the design or uh, whatever, but actually of the participation, because it is uh, a product of a lot of people, thousands of people's input. So the citizens feel that they own the product. It is their work. And so uh, when people are confused of the new interface and so on, we have a lot of volunteers, hundreds of volunteers on social network and so on to explain how the new system works. And we cannot actually buy this goodwill. <laughs> this goodwill comes because they were uh, participants in this process. And so participatory design, it is not only good to surface users' needs, but it also turns people who complain into advocates uh, for your service. And so this um, version has 96% approval rating, but even the 4% who are dissatisfied, they know their input will be taken into account on the next year's text filing experience, which makes it a long-term relation and not a transactional uh, experience uh, of the public service. And so back to the GDSG, that means that uh, we need to include um, people's uh, life events and we need to understand that uh, what kind of service they really need rather than just want. And also, we need to include all the stakeholders uh, into the definition of users because too often previously uh, in the system integration procurement, um, there's a tendency to design something that is convenient for the citizens or Vietnamese as we say here. Uh, but it means that maybe a citizen can save um, five minutes of work uh, using the system. But somewhere, 
a public servant has to spend 10 minutes to reduce five minutes of the citizen's work. So it's actually not a good deal if you look at it from a utilitarian viewpoint, uh, but this part is hidden and the citizen is very loud. And our users, but the public service, uh, or actually uh, the Gongong Xinjian Tidai alternative military uh, service people uh, are not users, so it's okay to, to waste your time. Uh, that was the bad old days. Uh, but now, of course, we're very fortunate because there is no public administration alternative service anymore. Uh, and so a lot of um, agencies which relies on alternative service uh, military personnel now actually comes to my office and say, oh, minister, we really need to digitize our system because they don't have anymore to, to, to automate or semi-automate uh, those um, workflows. And so when we go back and look into the uh, user experience, we now explicitly say the frontline uh, public servants, the people who actually operate the system on the government side, they're also users. Uh, and it's good for users only if we can save two minutes of the citizen's time and also save two minutes of the public service time. And that is the kind of design we want. And we spell it out very clearly in the government digital service guidelines. And so that is the most, most important part. And the second part, which is not as important, but still very important, is to have a um, coordinator that can talk across the different uh, skill sets and the different fields uh, and build uh, capacity building across the different um, ministries or agencies involved. That is because it is uh, very easy in the previous uh, battle days. Uh, if you have one workflow, for example, open a company uh, that needs registration in the Ministry of Economy, in the Ministry of Finance, uh, in the um, um, so-called uh, company registration system, and also um, healthcare and all those different um, paperwork that you need to file. In the previous days of what we call the IT uh, plan, um, Normally, each uh, of these frontline paper-based services will be turned into one website. But now, instead of you know the people who are starting a company just taking a huge stack of paper and go to a common building of all the different ministries, they can file in most of their paperwork just by going from one front desk to another front desk, and they get to know a few new uh, friends, I guess. But that is the social behavior. But now, uh, you, using uh, IT-based thinking, uh, all those four services now become four websites, and they have to for file four very different um, you know, formats and services and things like that, and they don't get to meet new friends. They just think that there's a lot of repetitive work and it tends to make the user very angry. Uh, and so what we now do in a so-called one-stop service is actually to make sure that the people only need to fill in their information once and let the machine talk to with the machines, so to speak, uh, to make it seamless uh, to the user and the user only have to file their information uh, to the same uh, front Web website, but all the back end systems, of course, are all there. But during the procurement, we say all the vendors who um, have this capacity of building machine to machine, what we call open API interfaces, uh, they're considered professional. But if they cannot build a system that can be read and written, read and written by other computers, uh, if it's only human readable but not machine readable, if it's only human writable but not machine writable, then actually they can be disqualified for unprofessionalism. And so we put it in our procurement rules that all the vendors who build those backend systems, they have to put in open API uh, sockets so they can talk to each other so that people can just fill in once and for all the backend systems to integrate together. And now, that is only the technical part. Uh, in reality, of course, everybody knows that it's uh, impossible to get all the different owners to magically understand each other's needs, which is why in the GDSG we say we need to have someone who are uh, a de dedicated coordinator or communicator. They can belong to one particular agency, but they need to think and facilitate conversation to all the related agencies. Uh, for example, I worked on 
personally on a case called Yuan Jian Quan Jiang Jiang Huan, a exchange of the uh, documents between the uh, Ministry of Justice on one hand and the Judicial Yuan on the other hand. Uh, previously, in the battle days, they need to uh, copy, make a photocopy of the papers, deliver the papers, the people there cannot use this photocopy so they have to scan it again and during their scanning the, this site actually need a copy also so they also borrow it immediately back uh, for scanning after completing the by law required delivery strategy. So at the end uh, one copy is made, two scan is made, a lot of document traveling is made and it's all duplicated work, right? It in increases everybody's uh, burden with without actually uh, making anybody's life better. But the uh, reason why is that there's no um, kind of uh, coordinating person that says it's okay for anyone who originated their document to do the scanning on one side, do a digital signature, and have the other side to trust this digital signature. That's actually all, all it takes, and uh, it turns out that uh, all the technical parts are already there. The Xinbei city has been trying that for a while now, but they just need someone who can be trusted by both the judicial yuan and the executive yuan to say it's okay to do so, that that's all, all I did. And then now they're um, exchanging in a very progressive way, in a digitized scanning way. And so we now put this experience into the DGSG and ask the uh, procurement before they buy anything to first uh, procure a service, maybe under one million NT dollars, uh, that does this kind of user research and design. And only after this design phase and the discovery of a coordinator um, that can work across the different stakeholders, then we move into uh, the third uh, page which is to understand the different modalities like through chatbots, through website, through paper-based service, through telephones, through SMS and so on and to work across the channels that people actually need instead of just uh, think that it's uh, hip or it's trendy to work on. Now I don't have to, time to go through all the different principles and I just want to uh, highlight the, the one that's called uh, give priority to openness um, but I don't know what's happening here. Let's try again. Give priority to openness. And this includes not just the open API, as I talk about, but also open source, open data, and also open standards as ways to integrate um, this cycle. And because the more open a vendor is, the less lock-in power it has over the procuring agency. The agency can always say, okay, you do do this and it's not perfect, but it's fine because it has an open uh, standard and open API, so I can procure another front-end, another website or a mobile website or whatever uh, that integrate with the same backend service without replacing the database or the same uh, backend service. But if they're too tightly integrated, it's not open, in the communication between the front end and the back end, then it's impossible for you to procure um, another uh, solution to the front end without sacrificing the back end altogether and starting again, right? So I think uh, principle eight is also very important. So if you're a procuring um, agency um, coordinator, please do um, take a look at our uh, government digital service guidelines and to let us know how we can help you to do your work better. This is called beta version for a reason because it's subject to change. We will try this for one year and finalize on the version that everybody feels comfortable with um, a year afterwards. Uh, Chen Xinghui would like to know, farmers are suffering from the low price of vegetable all the time. Can government make use of big data to solve these problems? Yes, this is actually the first, the very first project that I work with um, in our website, pdis.tw. It lists a lot of work uh, that we do, but the first uh, project um, I worked on is actually um, the about vegetable prices. <laughs> and um, yeah, I, I wouldn't, uh, spend too much time on the exactly what we did, but it does um, make sure that the previously the different formats of the various different municipal uh, markets, as well as the correlation with the weather data and things like that, are actually um, put out in the public 
uh, in a uh, easy to understand way. Uh, I think. system. Um, yeah, so um, in the Nongliangshu uh, website, they actually make use of this data to send out uh, notice to the farmers um, well ahead in, in time and saying that it is it may be not a good business idea uh, to to work on this product because we predict that it will not have a good uh, price or the price will fluctuate and so on and so they did use um, analytics and so-called big data and to send out those ahead of time warnings and I'll be very honest and say our main challenge now is not about uh, gathering accurate data or even uh, accurate enough sensor data or uh, accurate enough prediction model, but actually it's about the farmers ignoring <laughs> the, the advices of the um, Council of Agriculture or the farmers um, you know, decide to gamble anyway, uh, even after understanding uh, the um, ahead planning. So that is actually a service design issue. That is no longer a data issue. There's only so much data can do, right? It's, it's at the end about trust uh, between people and about how, how people uh, see the government's messages as trustworthy and or useful to their everyday decisions. So there's a limit of what open government data and analytics can do. The last mile need to be filled by the people working in the same community. Just as I said, um, there's a limit of what Thai power can do to the indi indi indigenous people who want to own their uh, energy production. Um, we can offer all the technologies and all the solutions and things like that, but at the end, people locally need to organize and discover their own way to build a relationship with these data and these technologies. If that doesn't happen, actually, it will co sometimes cause a harmful effect to the local solidarity. And so, this is actually why, um, for example, in my office in the Social uh, Innovation Lab, we sure that we introduce new technologies or uh, so-called cutting edge, open data, open hardware, open source innovations in ways that people can have a first-hand experience that they feel as safe. Uh, these are uh, self-driving vehicles, uh, but they're actually tricycles, uh, so they're very slow uh, and they don't harm anyone if they run into buildings or, or something uh, because they're very slow and also they have the same right to road as pedestrians and so they, they don't actually go on the public roads, they're just like um, right? Uh, and so what uh, it does though is that it provides a safe interaction mode for people to see how it feels like to have those uh, self-driving technologies around us, how it helps for example, along the Jianguo flower market, uh, you can buy some flowers and put it to their companions and they just walk with you and at the end you can hop on one and they can drive you home and things like this. And so it shows the possibility of integration of technology, but not for technology's sake, but to improve the real social and environmental um, that people feel are important to their lives. And because it's all open data and open source anyway, so if you don't like the way that it shows a flash red light uh, when you don't know what to do or things like that, you can change that to a face, to a rainbow, a smiley or whatever, a cat face or something like that, and uh, experiment. And that is exactly what the local people in the hackathon did. So we're not saying, you know, the MIT Media Lab, which are the lab that designed these vehicles, can decide for Taiwan uh, how to interact with these self-driving vehicles, but rather people can discover uh, what is the best interaction mode for people to interact with these technologies. And that builds solidarity and trust between the people who uh, are working on hardware, on software, on communication, and on various technologies because they can then talk to their grandparents and say, oh, what do you feel about uh, you know, going to Jingle Flower Market with those companions and things like that. And that, I think, is really the only way to reach the last mile, to have the local people own and understand and can change the technology.
technology rather than the government saying, okay, we have all the perfect answers and you have to listen to our prediction because traditionally that's not working and recently it's um, even backfiring. So maybe there really is a limit to what we can do and we need to work with local cooperatives and social enterprises and local organizational workers and so on. And that really is the key to uh, what we call now the regional revitalization plan, uh, the Divan Chuanshan plan. Again, it is about to work together with the local society rather than having the academia or the national um, councils and ministries to decide for the locality. Instead, it's a very button-up uh, process. So, yeah, we can't use big data to solve all these problems, but we can put the data ready and make it useful and interactive and uh, trustworthy, And but we need to trust the citizens, but we need to understand the citizen doesn't always trust back. It's a very slow process for citizens to trust back. Uh, Agnes Jung would like to know, uh, after I become the digital minister of the portfolio, uh, what do I see the biggest uh, obstacle in our rock, uh, the ROC bureaucratic uh, system? Well, personally, I think um, there is um, a lot to say about the public service code uh, or Gong Wen Fu Fa. There's a lot of this um, that I think uh, doesn't make sense, uh, for, for example, this one. Um, there's, there's many parts of it that, that, that I think doesn't make sense, but I would just use this one as an example. Um, because, uh, of course, I understand that uh, we can't, uh, after work, represent our agencies. It is, of course, fair. But, uh, I mean, in our personal capacity, <laughs> now that this is, I think, um, quite um, unreasonable, actually. Um, and um, which is why, actually, when I joined the cabinet, um, I negotiated my condition joining the cabinet. Uh, so we kind of have a compact, uh, not a contract, but a agreement uh, of three things as I joined the cabinet two years ago. Um, one is radical transparency, uh, because in our FOIA law, uh, the There is a very um, similar um, part that talks about the um, kind of privacy of the drafting stage. Uh, and uh, right, this is the third clause, the drafting stage. Uh, information is not subject uh, to freedom of information. Uh, this, this one is not particularly wrong. I mean, uh, countries around the world all have very similar uh, clauses in their uh, FOIA law. But this one is very discretionary. I mean, w what does it actually mean to, to have public benefit? Um, so actually, it means that uh, everybody in the reporting chain need to agree that it's for public benefit. So you have to agree, and your uh, boss have to agree, your boss's boss have to agree, all the way to the premier. They all have to agree that it's beneficial to the public for a drafting stage information to be made public. But uh, as I negotiated my way into the cabinet, my first working condition is that everything I see uh, is of public benefit to publish. Uh, and there's no need for me to ask twice. And, and so um, this is called radical transparency. And this is why all the uh, interviews, all the meetings, including lobbying and everything, all the 3,000 people I interacted with, um, people get to see everything that I uh, hold as a um, digital minister. And so, for example, the social innovation um, connection uh, meetings it is a radically transparent record because everybody, um, after they make some contributions uh, and or some innovations and so on, everything is published um, to for everybody to see, and so people get to learn about not the what of the output of the policy, but also the why. Why are we talking about the um, summit of the social enterprise? Why are we talking about the cooperatives? 
uh, and the Laodong He Zuoshe, the uh, labor co-ops, and how uh, the Minister of Interior is now working uh, with the Minister of Labor to make sure that the Laodong He Zuoshe can work with government procurement in a way that is equivalent to the Lao Zifa, to the Labor Act, but without the Minister of Labor, uh, you know, um, getting ahead of its uh, jurisdiction, but rather have the Ministry of Interior to look after the co-ops and so on. And so all this has our structural issues that people have been talking about for like 30 years. But um, people on the outside really never learned about why are we talking about these things. And each and every public service member um, is kind of afraid of, um, I don't know, to Lee or something, uh, and in, in order to break the silos across the ministries. But using radical transparency, this is not live streaming or anything. Everybody, after the meeting, get to review it for two weeks before I publish it to the internet. So all the part that doesn't sound professional or could be taken out of context uh, is actually changed. So everybody is very professional in, in my transcripts. <clears throat> and so it shows that all the public service people are actually very innovative and professional. Uh, and then uh, it also creates a atmosphere that uh, people get rewarded for innovating because your name is on it. Previously, if you do something right, it's always the ministry's credit, it's never your credit. Uh, but if you do something wrong, the minister can always blame the public service. So it's a very unequal relationship. Uh, but now with this system, it's the other way around. The people who innovate to get the credit, and if anything goes wrong, it's always my fault. And so because of that, uh, people feel much comfortable in innovating and fixing uh, things that has been long-standing uh, structural problems. So just the transparency, I think, is very important. And um, when um, in my meetings, I said, you know, everybody gets a chance to edit after the meeting. Sometimes people go to a meeting and they just speak and they don't have time for listening. Uh, but after going back and reviewing what the other ministries have to say, they say, oh, minister, you don't have to hold another meeting anymore because after reviewing, I, I, I think that ministry really has a point. Uh, so we, we don't really need to uh, work on this anymore. I agree with your point and things like that. So a reviewing after the meeting, I think is also very important. Um, the other two working conditions, other than radical transparency uh, for my work, is location independence. So anywhere on Earth, um, I can do my work and it's considered working. Uh, and the reason why is that Xi Jinping has a uh, interpretation um, a few years ago that says any public servant that works with the internet, um, or something, uh, is not limited by the place and time of working. And so it is actually a very powerful interpretation and not many people know about this. Uh, and so anyone actually can use this to, to work with your um, agency and say, you know, my work has something to do with the internet so I don't have to work here anymore. I can be just working, touring around Taiwan and working in Penghu or whatever, right? Uh, and, and, and again, this is a valid interpretation and it's the same with the labor law actually. The Ministry of Labor did a very similar interpretation uh, back in 2015 that leads to uh, what we call yuan qi lao dong yuan zi or dian chuan lao dong yuan zi or something, the teleworking regulation. And so it's not a privilege of the public service, the uh, people in the labor workforce, they can also enjoy the same teleworking conditions. Um, and that's one of the regulations that I helped uh, consulting when I was still working with the government as a consultant. And so I just put it into my own use <laughs> after being the digital minister. So that's called location independence. And the third thing is voluntary association, meaning that I don't give orders and I don't take orders. Uh, any meeting that I hold, I always start with saying, you know, there is no cai shi, there is no decision making from me. All I make is suggestions. And if you don't think these suggestions are uh, good for your job, feel free to ignore it. Uh, and I think it creates a more equal relationship between the ministries and me, because in many other ministries with a portfolio, they supervise maybe five ministries. Uh, or four ministries or three ministries each. And people think that they're more focused on these ministries. And so when they work across ministries, uh, people naturally see kind of a boundary of the kind of scope of their work. But because I supervise no ministries, uh, so um, people
people don't think that I'm partial to any ministry, and therefore I can work with all 34 ministries. I think now I kind of equal distance, and so that's the third condition of my work. So because of this, my, my work is actually quite um, enjoyable <laughs> because I, I don't really give orders, and I get a lot of volunteers uh, to join my office from each ministry. So I, uh, after joining the cabinet, I had an agreement with the Secretary General and say, okay, in my office, in the public digital innovation space, in PIDAS, uh, I can have at most one staff from each ministry, but, but not more. Uh, so um, technically, I can have 34 uh, staff. Now I have 22 staff, but um, so it's not everybody. We don't have a colleague from the Ministry of Defense, for example, but we do have colleagues from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, from the culture, education, interior, uh, finance, the NCC, uh, you, you name it. And so these are more people-facing ministries, and they uh, basically form my staff, and everybody can see what everybody else is working on. Their salary is still paid by their uh, originating ministry, and they do their own kaoqi, so they just file in their kaoqi biao and just sign whatever they, they put on it, and so it creates a very easy relationship <laughs> between them and me, because I'm technically just facilitating the dialogue between the values of different ministries, because each ministry is a different value, and this is true, but uh, what I do is to find the common values despite the differences. And so those are the kind of innovations that I kind of negotiated my way in, and some of it, I think, are seeing more widespread adoption, uh, such as the use of the Slido system. It is a very equalizing power, because otherwise people who uh, are here, but their boss is also here, they were very afraid to raise their hand uh, to speak up because their boss is in the same room. Uh, but using Slido, people can very freely speak up because everybody is using their phone anyway. You don't really know who are uh, posting these questions. And this is uh, something that I see more use even in municipal city settings and things like that. Um, someone asked, is there any international cooperation that Taiwan is doing to combat misinformation? Yes, I'm glad you asked. Um, I, um, this is actually literally called Global Cooperation on Media Literacy. And this is a program that the AIT and the Taiwan uh, Foundation for Democracy um, collaboratively engages on. And this is not just building a relationship between, say, the COFAX, the Taiwan Fact Checking Center, or the ecosystem working on misinformation and media literacy, but also uh, everybody in our region, uh, in the East Asia, because um, disputed um, or misinformation is a, a global phenomenon, and it works by the effort of the design of the phone, because on the phone, there's a very limited screen, and people can usually only see partial information, and sometimes people just are engaged and become outraged or become very angry, so they share something without finishing reading it or without the capacity of looking for alternative information sources. And so that is the root of the problem. If everybody used a large desktop computer, maybe we don't have this misinformation problem. But in any case, this is a new phenomenon created by uh, social media and around um, our region everybody is kind of going backwards <laughs> by uh, curtailing freedom of speech and so on and so Taiwan really is the only example in our region that are working on this, this information in a way that doesn't compromise freedom of speech because kind of everybody else in our neighborhood choose the easy way of going back on freedom of speech. Uh, but now we need to prove that this is actually conductive to a democracy to work in such a transparent and open way, but rather than the other way around. Because everybody else, like when I visited Thailand in Bangkok, they also want to know if they go to democracy, if they start to have a popular vote and so on, that there is still a way to create trust rather than destroy trust because it seems like to them, maybe rightly, that it's very easy to destroy each other's trust, not just between government and citizen, but between citizen groups also, and there is no reliable way to generate trust. And so the timely response that we put on the administration website, um, the connection that we built, 
uh, to clarify misinformation, the kind of uh, open government work we work as part of sustainable goals, the kind of collaboration we do with the fact-checking systems, they are all examples for this region uh, to, to adopt. Now, this is not saying that we're doing better than our friends at the European Union uh, or other um, regions like New Zealand and Australia. Uh, they're also doing pretty well without sacrificing the freedom of speech. But at least, or Canada, they're also doing quite well. Uh, but at least in our region of the world, if you select Asia and then fully open, really there is nobody else uh, all the way to Africa. Uh, and so the global collaborations also means that people in our region look up to Taiwan uh, and see the kind of solutions in the way that we're using and use that as an example uh, to go back to improve the civil society and misinformation ecosystem uh, that they have in their local uh, jurisdictions. Um, so yeah, I, I think we're really leading the region uh, in these efforts uh, and our examples are being closely uh, watched and studied uh, by nearby jurisdictions. Um, to decide whether they're going back to open after narrowed or they're going to the obstructed uh, to curtail on the freedom of speech and freedom of assembly and so on. Uh, do government has any method or law to limit um, this information? Yes, we do. Um, there's many actually existing laws that already uh, talks about um, what we call uh, intentional, uh, untrue, and also harm. Uh, the problem at the moment is that all these different laws uh, use slightly different wording uh, to describe essentially the same thing. And so for the court system, it's sometimes very difficult uh, to interpret all the different connotations of these wordings because it's not made with this information in mind, uh, it's made with various different um, ideas in mind. And so the Ministry of Interior, as I shared earlier, uh, has re-focused uh, on the definition of disinformation, including the three components, and putting it uh, in the um, laws that they are now uh, putting forward to the administration meeting. And so I think they just passed the draft in their Hui in their ministry uh, level um, today, uh, and it will likely uh, be put into the executive yuan in the next week or so, where we will hear more about these upcoming law amendments that are made specifically with this information in mind and other uh, ministries will also follow. Uh, Chen Yiru would like to know, in our government current role, how technology is being to transform a lot more efficiency because of the competitive trend of globalization? This is an excellent question. Um, we, we work actually with all those open governances uh, that are willing to share their um, governance technologies and the digital uh, technologies. Um, I think it's a group called the Digital Seven, uh, which is not um, as famous as the G Seven, uh, but it is a, a group of people um, in working in government technology in Estonia, Israel, New Zealand, South Korea, UK, Canada, and also Uruguay, uh, and they're uh, committed to basically leverage the globalization trend and see that actually we have a lot in common uh, to, to work with. For example, the CI system, the civil IoT system I talk about, is not just about air quality, it's also about water pipe um, measurement. And the Taiwan Water Corporation actually maintains the longest pipeline in the world for any coal corporation. And so they have a lot of data uh, of uh, water pressure and water flow and so on. And in our presidential hackathon, they work with AI researchers to work on what they call to a robotic apprentice uh, to those uh, people who listen for new leakage in the pipe system. And so uh, they can use uh, line uh, to work with these AI to train those AIs to detect early on what are the pipelines that are currently leaking and solve the water shortage uh, problem by plugging the leaks as quickly as possible. They shortened the time 
that it takes uh, to detect those leaks uh, by 10 times. So it only takes one tenth of the time as compared to before. Now New Zealand, they actually didn't have a problem of water shortage, but now because of climate change, they now do. And so because of that, in my proprietary software, they collaborated with the Thai, uh, Taiwan Water Corporation and the uh, AI researchers. So they worked together for three months, after three months of working here in presidential hackathon to develop a technology that the New Zealanders can own locally. So this is not a colonization kind of foreign aid, but rather a partnership between the digital nations to solve their common uh, social, environmental, and governance issues. And so the point here is that they're all committed to leverage this open government trend worldwide to work closely together and reuse each other's governance components. Uh, and Taiwan is actually part uh, of the group, but for obvious reasons, we're not on Wikipedia, uh, but we, we do work very closely uh, with the Digital 7 and share a lot of government technologies. So if you're interested, feel free to look up the Open Government uh, Partnership, the OGP. Uh, which t talks about the kind of uh, reusable, globalized IT um, that all the governments can work together on, and specifically the part of the OGP that causes of the Digital 7, which will have an even more uh, close relationship on a day-to-day -day, uh, operation level. Now, of course, on the OGP website, you also don't see Taiwan, but that doesn't mean that we're not working very closely together. Uh, so yeah, there's part of it that's political, but there's also parts of it that's operational. Now we're working on a lot of deep operational uh, connection, while maybe the political part will improve um, after a while. So I, I think that's it. Um, I'm sorry that I can't go through all the 28 questions, but I uh, assure you that all these questions do count as questions if you put your real name on it. Uh, and thank you for the two hours of conversation. These are very good questions. Thank you.